Oh, praise the Lord. Bless you. you. You may be seated. We appreciate your prayers of support. I love Refuge. It's the best church that I know. I said, it's the best church that I know. Praise the Lord. And I am so grateful unto the Lord for his goodness and his mercy and his favor that he has given unto me. You know, some things we think we deserve. Then there are other things we know we don't deserve them. And yet the Lord gives them to you anyway. So I praise the Lord. I appreciate him. I love him so very, very much. We do honor the Lord this morning and to all of his people. Praise the Lord. We thank him for his gift to us in the person of his son, Jesus Christ, who he sent to a cross to shed his blood, to pay for the penalty of our sins. And I thank God for that. We do honor all of our clergy that is here, Elder Vaughn McCree Jr., to Elder Ronald Golden, to the absence of Elder Clarence Johnson, to Elder Joseph Hillmeadow, and to Minister Housley. To our deacons, we thank God for you, the missionaries, the mothers, praise the Lord, everyone who is playing a part this morning. We thank God for you. If we have any visitors, thank you for coming to be with us this morning. We really appreciate your presence. And I know the Lord has something for you. Uh, we happy we celebrated the 104th Holy Convocation in the city of uh, Orlando, Florida. We praise God. He took some of the saints who went on the uh, railway and some drove over the roadway and some flew over the airway. And the Lord brought us all back safely. <laughs> Hallelujah. And uh, unfortunately, there was a downside to this holy convocation. Um, members who were there contracted COVID because there were no mask, uh, um, there were no mask uh, mandates. Praise the Lord. So some of us got there and did what everybody else did. But unfortunately, you have to protect yourself. In this church, we have, you can wear a mask or you don't have to wear it. If I were you, I'd wear my mask, but I'm not you, so you have to do that according to your conscience. Uh, but we thank God for this day. Uh, we won't be serving communion because we have a large number of members that are not here. And I don't want to serve communion without, you know, saints having an opportunity to take communion. I'm asking you to continue to pray for our sister Teresa Melton and her family. The Lord transitioned Mother Odessa uh, Melton home to be with him. And uh, pray much for Brother Jerome Lord, who tried to sneak in and thought I didn't know he was here. He's right over there. Praise the Lord. Also, Sister Regina Everett's daughter, she needs prayer. Jermaine Sutton, remember her in your prayer list. Also, pray for Deacon George and Mother Barbara uh, Han. Pray for them in the name of Jesus. And uh, we thank God for Sister Christine Bryant, who's been... who's been in the hospital, out of the hospital, home. And uh, she walked in today, and I said, who is that woman with that big old sun hat on? Praise the Lord. Thank God that the Lord brought you here safely. And also, Brother James's grandmother had a stroke before we went to uh, Florida. Pretty much for his grandmother in the name of Jesus. God is a healer. I said, God is a healer. Hallelujah. He is a healer, and he's healing all the time. And remember Mother McCray, she's coming along, and uh, pray for her. Hopefully, she'll have her surgery soon in the next three or four months, and that will help alleviate some of the pain. God's the only one that knows why he does the things he does. 
but I'm just so glad he does it the way he wants to. Praise the Lord. I'm going to pray. For, I want you to pray for me, rather. I won't be long this morning in the name of Jesus, but I want you to turn to me with me in uh, the book of Romans, chapter number six. And I will read the first verse and I will read the 12th, the 13th and the 14th verses. That is in the book of Romans, chapter number six, beginning at verse number one. And when you have it, will you stand to your feet for the reading of the word of the Lord? Romans chapter six, when you have it, will you say amen? What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Verse 12. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that you may obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. Let the church say amen, and you may be seated. I want to speak to you from the subject, shall we continue in sin? Praise the Lord. As a preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ, you have to talk about sin. And it seems as though in some reformations, that's the last thing preachers and teachers are talking about. I believe it is because sin is something that everybody knows exists, but they don't want to openly express it. And yet sin is everywhere. Sin is in everyone. Sin is in all places we go. The Bible contains a clear and obvious doctrine on the subject of sin. One that is apparent, beginning with the first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis. And it is a consistent theme that reoccurs throughout the scripture until the last book, the book of the Revelation. As much as the doctrine of sin is an important subject, it is one that is not readily discussed in today's society. One reason is because sin, like death, is not a pleasant or an enjoyable topic. You know, sometimes uh, uh, people try to avoid sin, try to avoid death, as if we're going to live forever. But it's inevitable that all of us one day must give up the ghost and go meet our maker to receive the deeds that have been done in our body, whether they were good or bad. Secondly, sin is welcomed on a majority of levels in our society and culture because sin is profitable can the church say amen it's profitable in our society everything that man looks at and says it's enjoyable it's satisfying i want it it's sin praise the lord and nevertheless it is necessary for us to discuss sin in order to shed light and in order for us to understand the purposes of God and his dealings with sinful man. Although we talk about sin, I'm not convinced that most of the people really comprehend what sin is. Praise the Lord. We call it. Where did sin come from? How did it originate? And what are the devastating effects of sin in our lives? and our relationship with God as a result of sin. All of us live in a society that is constantly trying to repackage sin in our world. 
you know, it's sin, but let's call it something else. It's sin, but let's not admit that it's sin. Let's change it into something that is pleasurable. Therefore, people won't feel guilty when they participate in it. There is a concerted effort to relabel sin and to market it as one of those most desirable things, most satisfying experience that a person could ever have. From toothpaste to mansions, it's all glamorous. And they always have something in there that makes people have an appetite to want to participate, to want to watch. And Lord knows today on the television, you, you can't even watch something without cussing, sex, violence, you know, but that's sin. It has become acceptable in all realms of society throughout the globe. The culture takes the old product of sin and sells it as a brand that is an acceptable way of life. And we as saints have to be careful that we don't get carried away and say, it's just TV, it's just this, it's just that. Praise the Lord. The Bible says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For all that's in the world is the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the arrogance and pride of life. These things are not of the Father. These things are of the world. And our society tries to desensitize us so that we no longer resist those things that would damage our lives and damage our souls. Therefore, sin is presented as something that is acceptable, something that is glamorous, something that compels us to want to partake. There are billions of dollars spent yearly on getting people to participate. Today, on the way to worship, I went by the Philadelphia Zoo, and uh, people still using Sunday as a, a day to enjoy themselves and rest up for Monday. But if they only knew that Jesus was coming soon, praise the Lord, they would find themselves in a worship house listening to the word of God, trying to prepare their lives for what is to come. Praise the Lord. They want to minimize the result, the, the, the impact of sin and say, just do it. You know, just do it. You can just do it if you want to, but there's a consequence that you have to pay. Praise the Lord. The wages of sin is what? But the gift of God is what? Amen. Give me eternal life. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus Christ. That was Satan's original comment about the consequences of sin. And because we can't see the end of what sin is going to, uh, the result of sin, which is death, people participate in sin because they feel as though there's no penalty. There's no, if there is a crime, I got over. But all at the end, you're going to pay. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Jesus Christ. Praise God. Where he's going to judge our deeds. He's going to judge our thoughts. He's going to judge our mind. Satan's original comment as he tried to minimize the word of God concerning sin and disobedience. When he walked up on Eve and said to Eve, have the Lord not say that you can enjoy all the trees in the garden? And uh, Eve said, yes, but he told us this tree we're not supposed to eat or touch. And the devil lied to her and told her, you won't surely die. Praise the Lord. He lied in that conversation. And the devil is still lying today. Praise the Lord. Lying to people. Tell them church is not what's going on. You know, you're young. you old. God still loves you, and you still love him. Yeah, the Lord loves every sinner. But when they die without Christ, they still go to hell. And it still grieves the heart of God. Oh, thank you, Jesus. What is sin? One definition of sin is an evil action or an evil motive that is in opposition to God. Simply stated, sin is failing to let God be God. Let me repeat that. 
not let God be God in your life because you have your own gods and there's no place for Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. If I want him, I know where he's at. I'll find him. But you don't know when death is coming. Oh, praise the Lord. If I were you, I would get right with God and I would do it now. It is placing something or someone in God's rightful place in your life. Sin is disobedience to the will of God. It is a failure to submit to the authority of God within your life. Remember, he, God gave you life. You say, well, I was born, my mother, and my father. No, God gave you life. And he wants to be the one who reigns supreme in your life. But he can't because you won't let him in. Disobedience or failure to submit to the authority of God. There are two ways you can submit. You can submit willingly or the Lord might have to use some other means. But in the end, you will submit to the will of God. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Sin is rebellion against God's morals for us, therefore declaring us a lawbreaker. And in God's realm, when you break the law, you are guilty before the Lord. Sin is an inward inclination. But that I mean it is inherent tendency that was transferred from Adam. Because people need to understand that just because you don't commit grave sins, that you're not a sinner. That's what's called moral righteousness. A person feels as though I didn't do anything wrong. I, I, I go to church. I, I, I'm faithful to my husband, my wife. I, I raise my children. I'm, I, I'm saved. No, sir. You have to be baptized in Jesus' name, filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost, with the evidence of speaking in tongues. And then you're right with God. <laughs> oh praise the Lord sin is an inward clinic we were born in sin and shapen in iniquity has nothing to do praise the Lord with what you're doing now you were born in sin you're a sinner but the good thing is that you're saved by the grace of God can the church shout hallelujah we're not sinners because we sin we're sinners because that's who we are Praise the Lord. Not only is sin innate, sin was not an acquired characteristic. It was not a learned trait. It existed in us before we were born. Oh, thank you, Jesus Christ. Listen to Romans chapter 5 and verse number 12. Wherefore, as by one man, who is Adam, sin entered into the world and death because of sin. And so death was passed down. It was inherited by all men. For all have sinned. Sin is rebelliousness and disobedience, as seen in the account of Adam and Eve. Don't touch the tree. When you get a law that says don't do this, don't do that, we can't wait to do it. We can't wait to break the law. Praise the Lord. I don't know. You tell a child, don't touch this, and they look at you and shake their head. Okay, I understand. And soon as you turn your back, what do they do? The very same thing you told them not to do. Praise the Lord. Sin is there. They rejected the God's prerogative to not touch the tree, don't eat of the tree. And they did what they wanted to. And the result was condemnation and death upon the whole human family. They rebelled against God's authority and were disobedient. They chose not to observe the boundaries that God has set up. Whenever you disregard boundaries, whenever you say, I can do what I want to do, I'm grown, there were consequences. You know, there's a fence there. The Lord put a fence there. You know, and he told you, stay within the, the, the confines of the fence. But there's a gate there. And so now I want to go outside the gate. There's a big world. I want to experience everything. 
and you open the gate and go on the other side, and there's a wolf ready to eat you up. Little sheep, praise the Lord. God gives us boundaries to protect us. God gives us rules to keep us safe and separated from harm. And you have to acknowledge the boundaries of God. If not, you will find your life in a position that you will regret. One of the things that is missed as it is relates to sin is that as pleasurable as sin is, there are serious consequences related to sin. Death is one of them. Praise the Lord. You know, hell is another one. Because after you die, in the end, you're going to hell. And hell is a place that is not doesn't have room service. No, sir. There's no bottled water in hell. Praise the Lord. It is a place of torment and torture because you rejected the pleas and the invitation to come to Jesus Christ. Thank you, Jesus. Listen to Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 4. Behold, all souls are mine, saith the Lord. And the soul of the Father, so also is the soul of the Son. They are mine. And the soul that sins, it shall die. Praise the Lord. Now, God doesn't lie. He's made a way for escape. But if you reject that way and you die, you're going to hell. Praise the Lord. That's the only way I can put it. Casually, it didn't say the soul that sinned will be warned. It doesn't say the soul that sinned will be rep reprimanded. No, the soul that sins is going to die. Praise the Lord. And I think hell and fire uh, messages need to come back into the church. Praise the Lord. Shake some folk up. Folks sitting in the church comfortable, living a sinful life, laid back in ease. They need to be reminded there's a consequence. And only in death, the final punishment for sin. Oh, praise the Lord. One of the things that you, when you sin or become a sinner, it is divine disfavor. Praise the Lord. Now, disfavor means God is not happy with the way you live. And because he's not happy, your life doesn't go the way you planned. And then you ask yourself, why does all these things happen to me? Every time I try to do this, right, seem like something happened. Who do you think is orchestrating that? Now, you don't want to admit that God is in control, so we blame it on the devil. The devil this, the devil. The devil can't do anything to you unless the Lord allows it to happen. Praise the Lord. God designed it to happen to try to get your attention, to let you know I love you. I sent my son to die on the cross for you. And you have the audacity to reject me when I'm trying to get you straight to go to heaven. Well, thank you, Jesus. Listen to Proverbs chapter 13 and verse number 15. Good understanding gives favor, but the way of a transgressor or a sinner is hard. And that word hard, it means constant flowing river. It means a person's life faces many harsh realities and rough times, and it don't have to be like that. <laughs> and the reason why I can tell you, because I've lived that, praise the Lord. When you say if you've lived both, both sides of the street, you remember how you were before you got saved? I wouldn't have wanted to meet me on the street. Praise the Lord. Because I knew what was out there. I was participating in it. Praise the Lord. It was a hard life. It was a rough life. It was a life with no happiness, no real joy. Just pain and struggling. Praise the Lord. Mental anguish. Praise God. But Jesus found me, put his arms all around me. And oh, the joy, the joy. Anybody have joy? The joy that came to me when I knew that I was free. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus Christ. 
Praise the Lord. I don't want to be in this favor with God. Praise the Lord. Sin places you on the wrong side of God. And I want to be on the right side with God. I want to be on the side when my life is overflowing with favor, with blessings. But sin prevents a person from enjoying that kind of life. Because uh, after you have this favor, there is guilt. Guilt is an inward a feeling of willfully breaking God's law. And that guilt keeps some people from coming to church. Praise the Lord. I don't want to go to church because I'm going to be reminded of my lifestyle. And that preacher, he always got something bad to say about me. Uh, sir, ma'am, don't get mad at me. I'm just the echo. Praise the Lord. I'm echoing what the word of God says. Praise the Lord. I'm preaching the word of God because that's what I'm supposed to do. Cry loud, spare not, lift up your voice like a trumpet in Zion. Show my people their sin. Don't just pat them on the back and tell them it'll be all right by and by. Time is running out and Jesus is coming back for people that are prepared to meet him. Well, thank you, Jesus Christ. People have an understanding and know that their life is not acceptable with God and then guilt comes and then the devil tells them, don't go to church today. But that same devil didn't tell you not to go out on Saturday night, did he? Praise the Lord. No, he didn't tell you. You need to get yourself together and go on and serve the Lord. No, sir. He deceives you and tells you that you got time, hallelujah, and the death angel stalking you, praise the Lord, waiting for the opportunity that he can take you, praise the Lord, sin not only affects the individual, but it also affects those relationships that are connected, sometimes we think sin doesn't, isn't my business, ain't nobody else's business, oh, but if you're a parent, sin affects your children, if your spouse, sin affects your family. Praise the Lord. Sin affects every part, everything you're associated with. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Sin has a consequence on the person who commits it. Sin has an enslaving power. Oh, thank you, Jesus. So glad I'm free. Anybody free in this house? Give the Lord a free. It has an enslaving power. Sin becomes a habit. Sin becomes an addiction. And where one sin leads to another. In some cases, sin gains so much control over a person's life until the only way to escape it is through the power of Jesus Christ. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Paul says that we were once servants of sin. But you heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you obeyed it from the heart. And the Lord delivered you. Praise God. Now I'm not a servant of unrighteousness. Now I'm not cussing and fussing and adulterating and fornicating and gambling and stealing and lying. I no longer do that. But now I got a praise in my heart. I got joy in my soul. I'm serving the Lord with gladness. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Sin has a denying effect causing a sinner to live in denial convincing them that what I'm doing is not wrong because it's not hurting anyone sin is hurting the individual sin hurts God sin hurts the people around you that have to witness the struggles that you're in sin affects everybody oh praise the Lord Sin has a deceiving effect. Not only does it give you the, the attitude of denial, praise the Lord, but it deceives both believers and unbelievers who try to deny the truth about sin. I mean, when you're dealing with God, why try to put on a mask? And the Lord look at you and say, you need to come to me. I'm a sinner. And you say, well, Lord, I'm all right. I'm all right. The deception, praise the Lord, the deception of sin. Let me move on. Sin has a, a way of deceiving us, thinking we're all right. But look at all them other people. 
you talking about me, but look at all them other people. You know? Well, what about all them other people? They either going to heaven or hell for themselves. So why are you worried about the other people? This conversation is about you and God. Oh, praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus Christ. Has a deceiving effect. Praise God. The word says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Pharisees could so easily point out the faults of everyone else, yet they were blind to their own sinful ways. You know, the devil always showing you someone else because he don't want you to look in the mirror and see you. Because if you become aware of you, you may try to do something about you. But as long as you're looking at Sister Janie and Brother Billy, praise God, Deacon Toby, praise the Lord. And what about that pastor? Praise the Lord. <laughs> no, you need to look at you. Jesus said, how can you all, you always got a solution for something in your brother's life. Say, but first, get your own life straight. Get your own life, and then you can pray for your brother. But in your condition, now you need to get your life straight first and then go on and help your brother. Oh, praise the Lord. Sin will have you to believe everything is fine. Everything you do, everything you think, not only will sin enslave you, but it will blind you. Sin will make you insensitive to God's warnings. Now, God always sends a warning before judgment. The Lord always tries to get your attention, praise the Lord, before something comes down that's going to be harmful to you. But sin makes us so insensitive that when the Lord is talking to us, we play him off. The scripture calls it dull of hearing. They have ears, but they can't hear. They got eyes, but they can't see. They got a mind, but they can't perceive that Jesus Christ is trying to help you and deliver you. Oh, praise the Lord. When God speaks to you, you should respond in obedience to the word of God. Sin has caused us as people to become so self-centered. So what's your name, brother? My name is brother me. That's your last name. What's your first name? My first name is all. My middle name is about. My last name is me. I'm brother all about me. That's what sin does. Self-centered. And when you're so focused on yourself, you can't help nobody else. Praise the Lord. So self-absorbed until no longer inter interested in anybody else's welfare. Anybody else's feelings. That's why. People hurt people's feelings. Don't want to apologize. You know? Now you you know you hurt their feelings. And, and, and you so sanctified and messed up, you don't even know how to say, I'm sorry, forgive me. Because it's not about their feelings. It's not about them. It's all about me. Where that's coming from, but thank you, Jesus. <laughs> In my clothes, and now I'm going to wrap this up. Sin causes restlessness. An insatiable character of sin is that it's never satisfied. There is never enough covetousness, greed. Praise the Lord. Sin is competitive, competitiveness. Rather than working together in unity, we strive with each other. Instead of completing one another with our gifts and abilities and talents, to help one another, we compete. It's the top this in the church. If somebody shines, you want to throw shade on them. And then you want to shine, and when somebody throws shade on you, you say, that's not right, Jesus. All the shade you threw, praise the Lord. Inability to empathize. It's all about my perspective, my opinion, my personal desire. Refusing to feel the love of God. 
and compassion towards your neighbor. Remember, it was because of love that God had for a, his bad children that he sent Jesus Christ down to die on the cross. And now we experiencing the salvation through the blood of Jesus Christ and the spirit of God. And then we don't have no love. Something's wrong with that picture. Another characteristic, sin rejects authority. The reason why it rejects authority, because it finds security in its own possessions, its own accomplishments. And any outside authority is threatened. All authority that is, exists comes from God, including the devil. He's under the authority of God. Praise the Lord. And we have to reverence God's authority. Inability to love. Another, look at our world today. Look at, the, I won't say the world, look at Philadelphia. And then any, you can pick any other major metropolitan African American in a city. How can people roll up on a person walking down the street and shoot them in the back of the head? How can people shoot women, children, grandparents? What does that say? That's definitely not love. But the scripture says because sin has abounded, because the love of many has waxed cold. The wickedness of sin causes people to be callous. They can't even feel compassion for a human being. They shoot people down like dogs and walk away and do it again. Now, we can say, well, there's not enough jobs for the youth. There's not this. There's not that. Real problem is sin. Sin has turned people into savages. Into savages. Treacherous. The scripture says in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be not lovers of God, but they'll love their own self. They will be fierce. Continent. Incontinent. Praise the Lord. These, these, these young people today. With these guns, they're, they're just savages, savages. And it's not them, it's sin that's causing them to do it. Praise the Lord. Thank you, inability to love. And uh, the last part I want to finish up with, I can't love the way God wants me to love because I'm too busy seeking to please myself. Praise the Lord. The, the sin problem is why Jesus came. God wanted to solve the sin problem that had corrupted mankind and caused them to be on the verge of destruction with condemnation and eternal damnation. The cross was the place where sin and grace met and man's sinful hatred of God. God's everlasting mercy and grace collided. They met on a hill called Golgotha, where God meted out the punishment for sin. The song says, mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened heart found liberty. Found it where at Calvary. Oh, praise the Lord is at the cross of Jesus where sin was dealt, the final victory blow, where sin was defeated. For centuries, sin had enslaved the human family. We were held captive. We were incarcerated in a prison of guilt and shame. Where the only visitors who came to see us were hopelessness, depression, and misery. The power of sin found that they, it would never release us. So, swore that the only way out was to pass through death. On your way to spend eternity in the corridors of hell. Well, thank you, Jesus. But Ephesians 2 and 4 says, 
But God, who is rich in mercy, oh, thank you, Jesus, for his great love wherewith he loved us. So when we were dead in sin, God quickened us together with Jesus Christ. By grace, you see, not because of who you are, but because of who Jesus is. So the Lord promised in the Old Testament one day he was going to break the power of sin. He was going to break the power of death. He was going to release his children. Oh, praise the Lord from the captivity that they were in. Surely, praise God, he kept his word. Praise God and sent his son, Jesus Christ. So, and Isaiah 53 and 10 says, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He put him to grief, praise God, when he would make his soul an offering for sin. He would see his seed and his days would be prolonged. The pleasure of the Lord would prosper in his hands. He shall see the travail of his soul and he shall be satisfied. Signifying, giving knowledge that my righteous service shall justify many. Yep. Oh, thank you, Jesus. But I'm so glad that the Lord loved me. Uh, I'm so glad that the Lord had mercy on me. Yep. Praise the Lord. We don't deserve what we have today. Yep. We don't deserve the Holy Ghost. We don't deserve heaven. But Jesus Christ came to deliver us. So, and it's not something he did in time, but the Lord is delivering right now. So, oh, yes, he is. So, is there anybody here glad for the cross? So, is there anybody here glad for the blood that came down from his side? So, the blood that ran down went from his hands and his feet. Anybody here glad that they took Jesus after they brutally beat him and put him in a tomb and the devil said it's over now but it's never going to be over. Jesus on the third day the angels came down and moved the stone and here come alive Jesus walking out the tomb saying I'm making a declaration all power in heaven and in earth is in my hands I am he that was dead but look at me behold I'm alive forevermore and he that believeth on me although he were dead yet shall he live and whoever believe in me shall never I say never shall never die oh thank you Jesus oh hallelujah Lord I praise you for what you've done thank you for the blood thank you for the Holy Ghost thank you for the joy thank you for the peace thank you for the favor thank you for the blessings thank you Jesus You've been good to me, and I praise you. I praise you. I praise you. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. If we could only comprehend the total love of God, hallelujah. He said, Jesus told us, I'll no longer call you disciple or servant. I call you friends. Because no greater love existed that a man will lay down his life for the brother. Jesus loved you. He had you on your mind when he went to the cross. That's why he didn't resist. He knew there was a greater purpose, and that was the salvation of the human family, the men, the women, the children. And he was willing to die 
for you? What are you willing to do for Jesus? Hmm? Are you willing to surrender your life and say, Jesus, I'm all yours. What you got to lose? Pain, tears, problems. What you got to lose? If I were you, I'd say yes to the Lord. I would ask the Lord on this day, Jesus, change my heart, change my mind, my spirit. Draw me to you, Jesus. Hallelujah. It's always in closer to Jesus. Hallelujah. Closer to Jesus. If I were you, I would think on this message, contemplate it, and ask the Lord to direct you, to bring you closer to him. Will you give the Lord a praise? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Will you stand to your feet? Everyone stand to your feet. It is a fact, and I know we who in Pentecostal circles have been hearing this from childhood. Jesus is coming soon. Now, we can't pinpoint when soon is, but I tell you what, it's sooner than it was 66 years ago when I was a baby. Look at the time we're living in. Look at the global unrest. Look at the, the, the climate. You know, look at the wars, the rumors of wars, the earthquakes and divers. But it's been predicted that when you see all these things, stand in a holy place. You need to consider coming to Jesus Christ. You say when? Right now. Right now. Right now. Jesus is calling you. And you know you hear the voice of the Lord. When Jesus starts talking to you, you put on your, what them earphones? You put on your earphones. You, you cut the music up louder. You turn to another channel. If I were you, I would pay attention. I'd hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying to you and come to the Lord. Bless you now in the name of Jesus. Is there anyone here?